Good morning, and welcome to the next lecture on wine in the ancient world, for which I'm wearing my uh, proper doodads. I'm actually here underneath the grape trellis. Um, I'm not sure you can see the grapes. They're actually in front of me. But the point I want to make in being out here today is that wine is very different from beer. It actually makes itself. There's not much you have to do, but crush the grapes. There'll be yeast on the grapes already to start with. And once it they invade the sugar that's inside the grapes, it makes itself into wine. So in a sense, we can say wine was really discovered rather than invented. I don't think it even took human intervention to start with. Um, if you wanted to do this yourself, which we're actually going to do tomorrow, you basically just keep pushing the skins and seeds down beneath the surface so the yeast keeps keeps getting mixed in with the uh, rest of the must, that's the grape juice that comes out of them. And then in about a couple of weeks, you have wine, you can drink it. Um, it doesn't last very long. Sometimes it tastes like socks, but, but that's, you know, the nature of wild yeast. And it's also why in the very ancient world, they really didn't keep wine around very much, um, last a year or so until the next harvest. But what it does mean, and I want you to keep this in mind, is that you need a lot of manpower to do the harvest. You need a lot of uh, people, often slaves or people who are hired in order to uh, crush on a large scale. And of course you need big vats and you need um, amphora and some kind of clay to keep them in. And that's what actually what's sitting behind me is a, a mock-up of a, an ancient amphora. So, but there really isn't much equipment necessary if you're doing it on a small scale. Um, if you have a a lot of grapes you really do need a press and that's another invention we'll talk about that comes along uh, something that is not necessary in in uh, beer beer so beer can actually be made on a smaller scale strangely enough um, so my other point here is that we really don't have evidence of what the earliest wines would have been like um, we can guess what they were they would have tasted like based on the uh, grapes that are native to um, the Zagros mountains and Turkey and Iran and Armenia and uh, that's the place where grapes grow wild. This is the Caucasus, okay, that the, those hills. Um, Haji Firuz Tepe in the Zagros Mountains in northwestern Iran has usually been cited as the oldest incontrovertible evidence of winemaking. Uh, the grapes, which is Vitis vinifera, are indigenous there. They still grow wild all over the place. And um, six two and a half gallon jars embedded in a floor containing these reddish and yellow deposits were tested and they reveal the tartaric acid that would um, be um, evidence of winemaking uh, as well as resin from a terebinth tree and this is an interesting thing in the earliest um, potteries would not have been glazed like this one you see in front of me which is um, baked with basically glass on the outside crushed silica melts into gla glaze so they would have to seal the jar in some other way because earthenware is actually uh, porous. So they would get a resin from a tree, melt it, and line the inside of the pot. And if you've ever tasted retsina, this is a strange remnant of that very early flavor of piney resin in the wine. Um, there were also stoppers, um, you know, for these, these uh, big vessels, so pretty clear that that's wine. And this is 5,400 to about 5,000 BC, so it's long before writing was invented, long before... Um, you know, we have any real historical evidence of anything. I mean, okay, this is after the agricultural revolution, obviously, but but long before um, the earliest complex civilizations. An equally strong contender for the title of earliest wine goes for the Transcaucasus region. This is on the other side of those mountains uh, in Georgia, not the state Georgia, of course, the country Georgia, with the Shulaveri Shomu culture. Um, there's linguistic evidence, and I think the, the most interesting of this is the word in Georgian, Irvino, seems to be how it got into the Indo-European languages. In other words, when they found the grapes, they said, what's that stuff? Mm, vino. It's great. It's, you know, grape wine. And, um, and there are also pots that date to about 6,500 BC. So that's even older than Iran. And so uh, an extensive evidence, uh, other kinds of evidence of, of grape cultivation, uh, grape pits, which sometimes last in archaeological digs. If you see a lot of those, you, you could probably guess they're not eating tons of grapes at once. They're probably crushing them and throwing them away. Um, the pots, which are something like an M4, and I'll talk a bit more about, we'll look at some pictures of M4 and thing. It's basically just a big clay pot that narrows at the bottom and has a wide top and usually a handle or two handles at the top. These were buried in the ground up to the neck. Um, and the logic of 
this is that the things underground stay relatively cool. They're about 55 degrees, especially a cave is ideal, right? But if you bury something, the um, it will stay relatively te even temperature, and that's exactly what you want to keep wine um, from spoiling. Heat will, will ruin it, actually. So the... Um, what they probably did was these big buried amphora were used to make the wine and then they would scoop out whatever they needed to uh, to serve from it and they still make wine this way in Georgia believe it or not it's it's actually become slightly fashionable now because it's wild yeast and no additives no sulfur no other things that people think um, give them headaches when they drink wine so it's so it's actually um, very interesting and you might also wonder um, we'll come back to this point later on but why would um, wine thrive in the Middle East, a place where Islam is obviously banned, alcohol. Um, I think the key in this case, the unbroken history in this case, has to do with the fact that Georgia is actually Christian. Well, in fact, the first Christian nation, Georgia and Armenia and those places, um, converted to Christianity very early, and so there was never a ban on winemaking, um, never any reason to stop making it. So that's, I think, I think an interesting fact about this, this area. Um, in the neighboring Islamic countries, there definitely were periods when it was completely banned. The Caucasus also accords very well with another mythical tale of the discovery of wine, uh, and this takes place in um, the very easternmost point of Turkey. This is a place called Mount Ararat, which is right in between Iran and Armenia. And as you might know this story, it's the point immediately after the flood where Noah and his family um, are saved. And the first thing that Noah did, does after the ark lands on the mountain is he plants vines, um, he gets drunk, and he takes his clothes off. <laughs> okay, now I'll, I'll come back to this when we talk about wine in the Bible, which is really very interesting. But this is the same exact region. So, so I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, literary evidence that, that this is probably exactly where wine comes from um, within, you know, a few hundred miles, certainly. So whichever place takes priority, I don't think is that important, really. Wine is a quintessential beverage of civilization. Um, it only becomes a regular part of the diet once people had settled down, once they start practicing agriculture, once they can plant vines and pull them all in at once and process them. I think you need uh, settlements and you... You know, nomadic wine is actually kind of um, impossible. You can't carry, you know, tons of wine along with you if you're nomadic. Um, I think clay is also very essential to it, which is why I'm hanging around with some uh, clay vessels here in the backyard. And um, because I think without clay, you can keep wine in skins, of course. Um, but for long-term storage, for to make it through the whole year, clay is impervious to insects and to temperature change if you keep it cool and to obviously it's waterproof too which is ideal you can't move with it that's, that's the interesting thing so nomads don't use clay very much but for a civilized country clay is great and it costs nothing right i mean you just dig it up out of the earth and fire it you know so it's it's very very cheap also and if it breaks so what you make another one um and of course um this coincides with the earliest civilizations it's about 6000 bc there's clay pottery all over the place in this era um and, uh, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence that says this is really where wine comes from. Entirely different kinds of evidence shows grapes being consciously cultivated. In other, and, and something I'll, I'll talk about also that's weird about grapes is you, you don't plant seeds. You actually can just cut a branch off and then put it in water and it'll root and grow and, and have the same, uh, you know, it, it propagates by cutting, which is, which is very interesting, very easy to do. Um, but the other kind of evidence um, is deduced from the shape of the seeds. And what is very interesting is in just the same way that humans um, domesticated wheat and other plants and, ch and animals and changed them in the process of living with them, uh, grapes are the same. The grape seeds are actually different from the shape of wild grapes, which are bigger, take up much, there are more of them and there's more in the seed. You don't really need that if you're, if you're propagating by cutting, right? So you want to choose grapes with the smallest seed and the most liquid per, uh, per grape. And you want, of course, volume, more volume of grapes than, um, you know, than a plant would need for reproduction. And in any case, the, the, the larger point to be made here is that settled agriculture, pottery, and wine are absolutely intertwined parts of the whole puzzle of civilization and how really explain how human life changed uh, completely um, in these couple of thousand years. Um, people 
um, I think wine is is essential to this whole bigger picture of why civilization happened and how. Um, the cultivation of grapevines also spread very quickly through what's today Turkey and into Greece, um, certainly very, very early times, and then southward to Egypt, not so much in, in, except in the very northern part of Egypt in the lower delta. Um, and it's partly because the movement of peoples, migration, uh, trade between these different civilizations is extensive at this point, and of course also war. Um, but another factor that, that again, I think you, you should really consider in all of this, um, compared to other plants, is that grapes are so easily propagated. Um, you can carry one. You could, you could take a, um, you know, a sprig of a grapevine, put it in your pocket, keep it wet for a year, and plant it later. <laughs> so you, could, you can actually take it on your journey. And, um, and of course, people do this, you know, when they, they um, take cuttings from, from European um, plants and put them in American rootstocks and, you know, for, for very various reasons uh, that they want hardier stocks or whatever. But the other thing is that they're a very good long-term investment. If you plant them, you're not going to have to worry about a crop failure or maybe they're not working. And I, and I would say, you know, I'm looking above me right now um, in the other direction, sorry, where the grapes are. But, you know, some years I get um, a lot more. This year is actually not so bad. Let me, let me actually just turn this around so you can maybe see what the grapevines look like. There's a whole lot there. Um, I'll bring in uh, quite enough for us um, to make wine with uh, in a, uh, tomorrow, actually. So, um, so the, um, you know, the other very interesting thing about wine, and I think this is a crucial factor, is that wine can be stored and it can be traded. So if you can tr transport one of these amphora, um, a distance and not break it on the way, um, you can actually amass money, buy, you know, land and build an empire, purchase slaves, build on a larger scale. So this is something the beer really doesn't lend it to, at least to start. Wine is preeminently an article of trade. Um, wine, olives for olive oil, um, and a couple of other things, but wine is really the, the important, the most important thing traded across the ancient world, and along with metals. Um, so we remember the Sumerians um, had to import their wine, uh, mostly from the mountains. It's much too hot on the plain, but I think also because the water is too close to the surface, um, and the vines strangely like to be punished. <laughs> they, strangely, they like very well-drained soil with the water way, way down. Um, and so there isn't a whole lot of wine in ancient Sumer. It's why it's a, a, a beverage for the elites, um, you know, who, if you see a big vessel with everyone drinking out of a straw, you know that that's beer. If they're drinking it directly from their cup, it's wine, definitely. Um, if we can at least trust the illustrations. Um, and this points to the beginning, I think, of a an extensive wine trade, which was carried, we know, up and down the Tigris and Euphrates rivers on barges. Um, and what's interesting is that they would could be sent downstream, but they can't be sent back upstream because you're going against the current and you'd need some form of locomotion, right? Or, or a mule barge or something like that. But the barges, once they got to the end, they'd be broken up. And so, so it's a one-way traffic. The wine goes down route and then you, um, you have to walk back with which, whatever you've, you've traded for, right? Um, so there are records, for example, from, uh, this is the Babylonian period, of wine being bought in large quantities by merchants, which were stored and then resold once they um, got to the city. Uh, for example, there's a and these are later, these are Babylonian, not Sumerian, but a letter from Belanu dated 1750 BC, which says this, the boats have arrived here at the end of their journey at Sippar, but why have you not brought and sent me some good wine? Send some and bring it to me in person in 10 days. So this is an instruction to his factor who's back at the place where the wine comes from. And he says, you didn't send wine this time. I wanted wine. Um, and obviously that's evidence that there is a trade in wine, but that, but that it's, it's valued and people you know, can get it in 10 days. It's not so bad. Um, and as we'll see, wine culture flourished. And some of it, I would suspect, is, com is consumed locally, but carrying wine to other regions is just as important. And in fact, for some cultures, it's absolutely essential. Um, they not only trade with wine, but they spread it throughout the Mediterranean, as we'll see. This is definitely the case with the Phoenicians. When we get to them, they take wine culture to Northern Africa, to Spain, to um, 
uh, Sicily, places like that. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to them. But long before these um, peoples, let's think about the Egyptians too. Let's not leave them out of the picture. They bought wine from the Eastern Mediterranean, from the Levant, meaning what's today Israel, Lebanon, um, Syria. Uh, as early as 3150 BC, there are tombs. This is from a guy with the delightful name Scorpion the I that contains wine jars that are pretty similar to those that you find in Iran. They're made of clay. Um, the clay has been sourced to Jordan, so it's, you know, pretty local also. Um, but that's 500 miles that, that they would have to travel um, by donkey and then by boat to get to Egypt. And so by about... 2500 BC, um, the Egyptians had been trading wine, but they decided to start making it themselves, which is interesting, uh, particularly in the Nile Delta of Lower Egypt, which is not quite so hot. It's, it's cooler and it's better um, irrigated. Um, but these are mostly private gardens. I think that's the interesting thing. They don't commercialize much. They, don't, they certainly don't trade in it. Um, Egypt was fairly self-sufficient in food and various other products. So if you see a garden or consumption of wine, it's something like this. I mean, it's just a little private hobby garden, you know, that the person would grow and for their own personal benefit. Um, and this means that processing could be largely manual or um, meaning you use your hands or your feet, I guess, more often. Um, you, and, and that's all you really have to do. You, you just put the grapes in a big trough, you tread them, um, you let them sit on the skins if you want some color and tannins. The, that's the sort of mouth puckering effect that wine has um, not only makes it um, good to pair with like fatty food and things like that but it also uh, helps preserve the wine so this is something that unlike beer where you have to add something to add the bitter preservative it's already actually in the grape um, if you have a good variety with a lot of tannins and you let it sit on the skins that works so what you do after that um, really kind of simple there's illustrations of this um, is you put it into a sack or some kind of bag you attach a pole to the top of it, knot it up, then you twist it. So basically you're making like a tourniquet on top of the bag that's squeezing out all the liquid. And we'll, we'll actually, we'll do this the same way, why not? Um, and then you pour that down into a ceramic jar. You seal it with clay, it was perfectly easy. Um, and then you'd basically, all you'd really have to do is poke a little hole in the top to let out the CO2 but you want to be able to seal it later because once that fermentation is done, you want to take off those skins and seeds and you want to cap it and seal it with either wax or um, clay or something that's not going to let the air in because the air will oxidize the wine and turn it bad. Um, now, what's interesting is that quite often, they better not be stealing my grapes, uh, is that the... Um, is that the seals often contain the year that the wine was made, okay? Because they, they don't want to be selling something that's a couple of years old. So this is kind of a guarantee that here's where it came from, here's the year it was made, sometimes the producer is put on it. And I think that's amazing because it's the first commercial labeling we have, right? We, we, you know that if wheat was transported or cow or something, it wouldn't be a commercialized product with a, a label of, you know, ingredients and weight and whatever. But on wine, it is the first commercial object that has these kind of, um, that lifts the vintage, right? And the producer. And, and it does exactly the same as that a wine label would do today. And we have actually the contents of one such cellar this was buried with a pharaoh who you, I'm sure, know very well. This is King Tut, um, who was um, buried in 1322. We know that he had red wine and white wine in the cellar buried with him, to obviously to drink in the afterlife. And there were 26 amphorae dug up um, in 1922 by the man who did the excavation of the whole site. This is Howard Carter. If you know, he met a very <laughs> a disastrous end because the Mount King Tut's tomb was, was cursed. But, but they did find wine. And one of these uh, amphora says, year five, this must be of the reigning king, sweet wine of the estate of Aton in the western river, chief vinter Nacht. So this is, this is really a wine label. Um, and it was a 
sweet white wine. I, I don't know how they t told that, but um, made not far from what's today Ale Alexandria, which is Alexandria in Egypt. Um, and the very, <laughs> I guess the ironic thing is that this is the first really extensive wine cellar from the ancient world that, that exists. Um, and its owner was 19 years old. So he was technically <laughs> underage. So that's funny. So, but if we look at all the different cultures in the ancient world, the one that for whom wine was absolutely most important, not a luxury beverage at all, but actually central to the entire culture, it was the standard beverage for everyone, we have to turn to Greece. Okay? It's not an elite beverage there, it's an everyday thing. And, and I would say like much else of Western culture, we get from the Greeks um, the roots of our language, of our sciences, of our medicine, of our literature, of our history itself is a Greek invention, Herodotus. Um, and so I would, but, but I would go so far as to say that above ev any other consumable good, the civilization of Greece is actually built on wine. It's, it's the cornerstone. It's the reason it exists. Um, it has to do with the fact that the climate there is ideal. It's a Mediterranean climate, exactly like here in Stockton. Um, the, so the ground is rocky and well-drained. That's actually not the case right where I'm sitting right now, but it's, but, uh, in general, um, rocky. And it means that, um, it's the kind of, uh, soil that vines like, right? Um, and a few other things. Olives also are perfectly suited to this area, um, to a Mediterranean climate. Uh, and it also means that all the rain comes in the cold winter and the summers are very long and, and actually very, very hot and dry. Now, the other crucial thing about this, and, and I'll talk, you know, in depth about uh, Greek civilization, is that the soil is actually not very good for cultivating grain. And if grain is the kind of, uh, you know, staple of the civilization, it meant that the Greeks eventually would have to go out to plant their grain somewhere else. They'd have to actually found colonies and trade with them. And so the Greeks are a mercantile country from the very start, partly because they had the grapes to make wine, but they didn't have the flat plains that are well irrigated um, to grow wheat. Um, rocky soil and hills are just bad for cultivating grain. So the Athenians went in a couple of different directions. The, uh, the Greeks, rather. The Athenians went to the Black Sea. The Corinthians, that's one other city, went to southern Italy. Others went to Massilla, which is in present-day southern France. So they get all over the Mediterranean. And, of course, they bring with them not only um, Greek culture and theater and philosophy, and, but they absolutely bring with them wine grapes, um, and they plant them. And so, so the spread of the culture of grapes is intimately twined with the spread of Greek civilization. Um, and the, the deal that they had was that the grain grown in these colonies would go back to Greece and the wine and philosophy and whatever it may be went to the, went to the colonies. So they kept close ties. Um, and it meant that the people of Greece were very outward looking and cosmopolitan. And as you can guess, this made them um, rather experimental, right? I mean, these new colonies each had to have their own form of government. They invented from scratch. They had to um, experiment with forms of thought. So you find lots of different philosophical schools. It's not coincidental. This is the birthplace of democracy. Um, but it meant that the mercantile people um, engaged constantly in overseas trade. It meant that the wealth is relatively spread out evenly among the people. In other words, there's a, there's a, a large number of wealthy people um, in this culture. And it's why they insisted on participating in democracy, right? Why, why you know, if you have a large num proportion of people who are wealthy, they're all going to want to say in the, in the policies of the state. If you have one person who's an absolute ruler who has all the money, like in Egypt, people are not going to have a say at all, right? It'll be the pharaoh who makes, it up, makes up the mind. So, so just think of how the social structure and the distribution of wealth has a lot to do with something seemingly silly as, uh, what are they growing? <laughs> is it grapes or is it, or is it grain? Um, and so, and the other po point to make, of course, relevant to our story, is that if you have lots of people with wealth, what do they do with it? They educate their children, they patronize the arts, they hire philosophers to come and entertain them, they attend plays, and of course they drink a lot of wine. Wine is, is central to the whole civilization, and it is a very much a drinking culture. Um, we know the, the earliest of Greek cultures, um, 
are the Minoans who are on Crete and the Mycenaeans who are on the mainland. But this is this is um, pre-classical Greece. This is this is the the peoples that um, that Homer describes right in the in the uh, Iliad, the Odyssey, and. They drank a lot of wine, we know from direct archaeological evidence in Crete, certainly before 2000 BC. We know this because the Egyptians bought their wine there. That's where they got much of it. Uh, there's also evidence in Homer, right, in, in ancient authors like Homer and in Hesiod, who wrote this wonderful, um, he's, he wrote the Theogony, which is sort of a history of the gods, but he also wrote this book called The Works and Days, which is about... Um, sort of farm labor, what you do calendrically, you know, by season by season, when, when you plant, when you harvest, when you do various things. Um, and those are written, oh, about the 8th century BC. So this is, again, long before classical Greece. But they depict a civilization that's even older. They pick the Mycenaean culture, um, centuries before Homer, when heroes, you know, had drank vast quantities of wine and ate big hunks of roasted meat uh, skewered on, on a, um, you know, and... And, and they also, you know, used it in sacrifices. The, the Greeks used wine to seal agreements. You know, if you drink with someone and you toast them, or you say, this is my pledge, I swear by the wine, that it'll, I'll do what I say, and I'll pay you what I say, or trade you with what I have. Um, and they also, of course, used it for therapy. We'll see, wine is, is definitely a medicine throughout the ancient world. So, although the gods did actually not drink wine in, in the ancient um, myths. They drank nectar, um, not, not wine, and ambrosia rather than meat, right? The, and in fact, if a human eats God's food, he becomes a god. So this is why they don't, they don't share it with them. Um, but the thing, but, they, but the gods still do appreciate food when it's sacrificed to them. And this usually involves um, a consecrated kind of food that is destroyed as a means of showing thanks or of asking favor. And I want you to just think about the way that the ancient peoples communicated with the gods. Um, you, you know, you can't communicate with them directly, so you have to sort of catch their attention by burning something, a big animal, or, um, or offering wine uh, that is a sacrifice. Remember, we, we brought up this topic last time in our discussion. Um, and I, I want you to think about it more, because, it, because a sacrifice really is a means of communicating with the gods. Um, in this case, the people um, actually barbecue the food and they, you know, they, um, smoke is what the gods smell and, and they like it and they get nourished by it. I'm not sure how or why, Well, they don't have bodies, real bodies, I guess. I don't know. Um, but the, um, but the people later ate it, right? This was a communal barbecue. Um, but let's think a little bit more about, about sacrifices. Um, the, um, I think it makes people stop and think about the seriousness of killing, for one, if you're certainly slaughtering an animal and roasting it. Um, it also sort of makes you think about the labor that goes into wine. It's, it's, you know, it's an easy task, but if you're doing it in volume, it's a big, big 24-hour kind of thing for, that you do for a couple of weeks, which is happening incidentally right now, and the harvest is, is going on um, in California right now. Um, but the point is that these are acts that we do not take lightly. We don't consume the products of our labor without forethought, without really thinking of the fact that it's not necessarily an expensive thing, but it's a thing that's crucial to life and, um, and that we've put so much time and effort into it. Um, and it makes people recognize communally and actually ritually, right, because they do this the same way every year, how crucial these products are to their existence and livelihood. And it's why when you take wine, you offer a li what's called a libation. Okay? This is, this is uh, libum means drink in Latin. So a libation is when you offer some of the wine to the, to the gods, or you put out a cup for Zeus or Dionysus, or you pour it on the ground as an offering for the dead. And again, that seems like something that's really wasteful. Why would you do that? Um, you know, and, and in fact, if you're pouring it, who's going to get to enjoy it unless they're in the underworld? You can, you know, imagine the people licking the wine as it drips from the ceiling under there. I don't know. But, um, but, it's, but it's a way to appease the gods and make them recognize that you really appreciate their helping you and doing things for you. And if you don't make libations to them, it means that you're sort of not thinking about them. They're out of your mind. And um, so this is the way to talk to them and remind them that you're loyal. 
Um, Hesiod, as I mentioned, is another very interesting early source about winemaking. Um, it's not an agricultural manual per se, but it does recount in, in a poetic form all the kind of seasonal tasks that would be required uh, around the calendar um, on a farm, on a typical Greek farm. And that includes tending the vines, doing the harvest, making wine, all those are part of the things that he describes. And interestingly, he also mentions drying grapes. This is what, what we would call today a, um, a kind of late harvest, you know, raisin wine or something that's higher in alcohol because the uh, sugars would be concentrated as wine as the water evaporates out of the grapes. Um, but you get, you get something that's fairly high alcohol and sweet, and importantly for trade, it lasts longer. Okay, so if you can get really high sugar in your, in your wine, um, and convert it into higher alcohol, that makes it, it's better preserved by that, by that whole process. And we'll see some places in Greece um, thrive right down to modern times on their sweet wines. Okay, now, now uh, think about this because sweet wines have been sort of debased in modern culture because we appreciate drier wines and sweets, maybe for dessert, but, but you certainly wouldn't, you know, drink a sweet wine with dinner if you had any sophistication. It's because the, they tend to be the cheaper wines for less developed palates, um, the opposite in the ancient world. You, you'd want sweet, thicker wines um, then for, for the reasons of trade. Um, but let's, let's read to you some of Hesiod. This is a summertime picnic, okay? When the artichoke flowers and the chirping grasshopper sits in a tree and pours down his shrill song continually from under his wings in the season of wearisome heat, it's not wearisomely hot here yet, but it will be in a few hours. Then the goats are plumpest and the wine sweetest. The women are most wanton, but the men are feeblest because Sirius parches head and knees and the skin is dry through heat. I can appreciate that. But at the time, let me have a shady rock and wine of Biblis a clod of curds and milk of drained goats with the flesh of a heifer fed in the woods that has never calved and of firstling kids, and also let me drink bright wine, sitting in the shade when my heart is satisfied with food, and so turning my head to face the fresh zephyr, that's the, the wind that th blows in, from the ever-flowing spring which pours down unfouled, thrice pour an offering of water, but make a fourth a libation of wine. Pour the wine onto the ground to say thank you, Zeus or Dionysus, whoever it was, for um, giving you such a wonderful beverage to sustain you. So let's talk about the equipment a little more, about uh, some of the logistics of this winemaking. So wine was kept in an amphora. Okay, it looks something like the one that's sitting behind me right here that I actually made that one, but, uh, but they would have two handles and not be colored black like this. Um, they have a pointed base, which is kind of weird, because you think, well, well, how is this thing going to stand up? Um, the logic of the shape is that the weight is distributed around the top by the handle. So you can actually carry two big amphora um, at once, and um, if you had a, a cylindrical shape or a bottle shape, you, it would be much less gainly. It would be harder to carry. Uh, it's like if you're carrying a suitcase, the weight is at the bottom. It becomes really ungainly. If it, all the weight were at the top and it narrowed and you had a handle on the side, it would be easier to carry. Okay? Um, the, uh, and I should mention also, there are no barrels yet. Barrels come in late antiquity. Um, and the interesting thing about a barrel is you cannot carry a barrel. Um, it's designed to roll. You put it on its side and it has a point where the, where the staves have a uh, sort of apex and only that point hits and then you roll it up a, you know, a galley or roll it, uh, but you, you, know, you wouldn't want to be carrying this over mountains. So a barrel would be very badly suited for, for Greek um, winemaking. So they, they developed this amphora and it, it actually goes back longer than, than ancient Greece. Um, but the most interesting thing about the amphora is how do you ship them long term? Um, what they would do is they'd put sand in the bottom of a boat, which acts as ballast, in other words, so the boat doesn't float up and tip over, right? And then they put the wine amphora in the sand so they don't roll around. Um, so they're not stored upright like this. They're stored on their side, um, in half buried in the sand so they don't shift around. And it's really, really an ingenious kind of solution. Um, and they could ship them to Egypt or to the other side of the Mediterranean or wherever. Um, and we know about this because some of these ships um, 
crashed and sank, <laughs> and the M4 are still in there, um, you know, intact, exactly the way they were when, when the crash went down. Um, there are thousands of little vessels like this off the coast of France, and one ship had 10,000 M4i, which is the equivalent of 400,000 bottles of wine. So what we're talking about is industrial-scale production. This is not, not a small, small operation. This is a whole lot of wine supplying a whole city, it seems. So naturally, to do this, they would have needed industrial-scale processing also, much bigger troughs for treading the grapes, and most importantly, uh, equipment which would change the nature of how they crush the grapes. That's really the only difficult technical um, requirement, is a press. Okay, if you have a ton of grapes, feet are not really going to do it very efficiently. So the earliest ones are done with lever systems. And you all know the Greeks invented levers. Basically, you have a, you know, a, a fulcrum here and a very long beam. And if you press this way, the grapes, you, you increase the weight ratio uh, and the pressure that's put down here is much greater than if you were just pressing directly from the top. The lever actually increases your, um, your um, power, basically. Uh, lifting power and, you know, for lifting things and, and also for, for crushing. So um, imagine a box fit with a board that goes inside the box and then a lever that's connected to the edge, far edge of the box and a plunger that connects down. And when you hit that lever, it squishes all the grapes on the inside. And you obviously have to have holes in the bottom of the box. So all the, um, have you ever seen a ricer? It works the same way, you know, like that sort of device that mashes potatoes. I don't know why they call it a ricer, but it's for potatoes. Um, and if you used ropes connected to a windlass, you could actually get even more pressure. Um, you know, imagine the beam that's tied to a rope that feeds around a spool that then goes down. So as you pull, the beam tightens and tightens and tightens. Um, and this is actually described in um, Cato the Elder, who's a Roman um, agricultural writer. He tells you actually how to make the whole thing. Okay, is a is a a, uh, a press using a lever and a fulcrum. Okay. Um, screw press is actually much better because a screw press has a screw that goes down. That's invented in later Roman times. We'll, we'll come to that in a bit. So wine is also central to the religion of the Greeks. Um, the Greeks had a god of wine who's Dionysus, not just of wine, but of drunkenness. Um, and also of ecstatic revelry and wild, uh, irrational abandon. Okay, and we'll think about why a culture that is so rational, you know, keeps Apollo as one of its head gods and thinks and praises philosophy so much, would have this element of violent irrationality and destruction and drunkenness at its center. Um, now, who is Dionysus? Dionysus Bacchus is his Roman name. So he is usually said to be the son of Zeus and the mortal um, woman Semele. Um, unlike many other cultures, uh, the Greeks, the Greek gods, did what they want with, wanted with humans. They came down and raped them all the time. It's just, it's, they were bastards, really. Um, but in any case, Semele was the daughter of the king of Thebes. So, um, and there's this very bizarre story surrounding his birth also. So Zeus' wife, Hera, finds out that he's gone down and, and had his way with Semele. And of course, she gets very jealous. These Remember, these gods are petty and... Um, remember that humans make the gods in their own image, <laughs> so it's so they're they're very much like the Greeks themselves. So they, she gets jealous, disguises herself, goes down to Semele and says, "You know what, Semele, that baby that's in your belly, that actually isn't Zeus's at all. You know, he may have had his way with you, but it's someone else's. And when he finds out, you're going to be in big trouble." And so, so they do rotten things to each other like this. And Semele goes back to Zeus and says, if this is your baby, prove it to me. Prove that he's going to be a god. Um, but of course, if he does that, he has to actually show her, himself to her. And this is something he can't do. If, you show you, if a god shows himself to a mortal, she'll be destroyed. Uh, and she insists that he show her that he's a god and that this is her baby. And unfortunately, she does it, and she's burned up. Um, but Zeus rescues the fetus at the last minute and says, uh-oh, what do I do with this thing? And he cuts open his thigh and puts the infant inside and sews it up. And he says, I'll carry this baby in my own thigh. 
So strangely, Dionysus is referred to as twice born. In other words, he's born once, then he dies, and then he's reborn again. And I want you to think of that because there are some very weird parallels that are not coincidental between Dionysus and Jesus. So there's also an interesting myth about how, how he teaches humans about wine. And in some respects, it seems like a warning to me. I mean, you know, like, like the Noah story probably is. But Dionysus is lodged and fed by a peasant named um, Icarius and his daughter uh, Erigone. So he decides to share with them the secret of winemaking, is to thank them, right? And Icarius makes some wine and shares it with his shepherd friends, and they start to swoon, and they get dizzy, and they think, oh no, what has this guy done to us? We're all poisoned. This is the end. And so they club Icarius to death, because they, they all think he's poisoned them. Um, Erigone then can't find her father, and she says, oh, oh where is he gone? I have to find him. And the the uh, their dog, whose name is Moira, <laughs> that name goes and leads her to his body and says, "Here's here's your dad who's been beaten to death." And she finds him, and she says, "Oh no, this is terrible!" And she hangs herself. So it's not a happy story at all. Um, but Dionysus shows up and he goes, oh crap, what have I done? I gave these people wine and they totally messed up. I really feel bad about this. This was terrible. This was, I, I was doing them a favor by giving it to them and then they end up clubbing each other and killing themselves and doing all sorts of awful things. So, so he says, I guess I need to make amends for all this. So Icarius, he transforms into the star Boates. Erigone is turned into the constellation Virgo, which you might know, right? It's still there. <laughs> um, and the faithful pooch, <laughs> Moira, becomes the dog star Sirius. And in fact, Sirius um, XM, that's, the, that's the named after that star. So, um, and when all of these, when they appear in the sky before our autumn, right about now, actually, is a sign to start the harvest. So people, you know, they use myths to um, remember dates in the calendar and because they don't have clocks and, you know, think calendars to tell them what day it is, when those stars appear in the autumn uh, night time, that means it's probably, oh, beginning of September, mid-September, and it's time to start the harvest, the dog star. Um, and it, it also signals really hot days in the late, late summer, which is now. Um, so... Dionysus himself, let's get back to him, he's depicted in statues and poetry as being strangely, he's very young, he's not like the other, you know, long bearded gods, um, and he's androgynous, which means that he's got long hair like a woman, and he's sort of not manly, but not womanly either, which is weird, and he's accompanied by these female followers who are called maenads, we'll come back to them, and by satyrs, who are half man and half goat, so they're a strange breed of creature. Um, and they, um, they're always horny, basically. Okay, they're usually erect <laughs> all the time. And, and among them is often this other guy named Priapus, who's a god of sex and fertility who has an eternal erection. Okay, so, so this is also very weird for the Greeks who like to control, you know, everything, and including sexual behavior. This is very, very strange. Um, he car Dionysus carries this object also, which is sort of weird. It's a large stalk of fennel, so it's a big pole, let's say. It has a pine cone on top, and it's wrapped with ivy. Okay, <laughs> this is—he's always got this thing carrying it around. It's sort of phallic, but um, but also strange. So, what happens in the revelries where Dionysus is worshipped? Well, in this context, it is exactly the same thing as the entheogens we discussed a few lectures back. There is a mystery cult to Dionysus, which involves drinking wine and literally imbibing the god himself. Okay, And this causes a kind of possession. You become possessed by the god. He influences your mind and your behavior and, and everything. And in the ritual, what happens is you surrender your personal identity. You get swallowed up into the frenzy of the crowd, exactly what we've been talking about thus far in class, um, that, and feel, you know, that Freudian universal oceanic feeling that we were discussing. And it may be something, 
as I've been sort of hinting throughout the course, that we need to do. That maybe this is a, a, a kind of evolutionary survival mechanism. It's a time when we go crazy, we get together and dance and sing and drink and feel this communal oneness that would otherwise be, um, would otherwise be very lonely and, and disconnected. And it helps us survive as a tribe or as a community or as a city, that's what we're talking about now, because we need to cling to other people for protection, right? We can't survive on our own anymore as hunters and gatherers could have in small bands. But these rituals kind of remind us that we are not that important as individuals, but the society, the survival of everyone is. And the only time we can really feel that oneness with them is in these ecstatic um, revelries of, of, of unreason. Because if you think about it, you are the most important to you, your family, the people who are closest to you. You should, by all logic and reason, give your time and energy and resources to them. What this ritual is doing is telling you actually otherwise, is that your time and your resources belong to the whole community. And in fact, there are sometimes we're going to do things that are going to draw upon your resource, personal resources, like tax you, or call you to the army, and, or um, you know, demand your sacrifice for the state. That's a weird thing to do, because as individuals, of course, we're not programmed to do that. We're selfish, right? This is this communal ritual tells us that even though it doesn't make sense, we belong to a bigger social unit that's going to demand things of us. Okay? That's, that's an interesting thing. Stop and think about it. Every, next time you have to pay taxes and feel <laughs> resentful. I don't know. So Dionysus is also the god of disorder. And in the ritual, people are often masked, okay? And this is interesting because it, it um, you might not know this, that the earliest forms of theater evolve out of the Dionysian um, revelries. In other words, you know, it just becomes more formal. They start saying the same things over and over with a chorus in front of an audience. And this is the birth of theater, literally, is right here um, in these festivals. Uh, the most important of these festivals is called the Anthesteria, which takes place when the wine jars are opened, and that's February, so that's about five months or so after the crush. Um, wine does need a little time to settle, and, and uh, the flavor becomes better after five months. Um, and the word itself comes from anthos, which means blossom or bloom. In fact, an anther and a, and a flower is the same word from Greek. Um, and what that means also is that the word itself is cognate with the word andhas, which is used in ancient Sanskrit for something else you might be familiar with, which is called soma. So I want you to just consider for a moment that there's that these cultures are actually connected prehistorically, um, and that the some of the linguistics remain for um, things that are essentially the same functionally within within the culture. The, the rituals are the same. So that I don't think it's coincidental that anthos and the anthurium festival. Um, is also the same word as andas in, in uh, Sanskrit. So what they do, and they have these big um, vats, they're called pithoi, they're, they're different than uh, an amphora, they're much bigger, and that are opened up. The wine is dedicated to Dionysus, and this is the one time everyone gets to drink it, even the slaves. Um, slaves are usually given you know, bad water or, or wine that's got sea water mixed into it so it doesn't go bad. That sounds so bad. Ugh. So, um, but in a sense, it's also a kind of ritual inversion, a social inversion in which everyone suddenly seems equal. You don't have to show that kind of deference you would to your superiors as you do the rest of the year. Um, someone would be crowned the king or the queen of the festival and there would be drinking matches, and everything sort of is turned upside down. It's the one day that the slaves get to behave and drink with their superiors. Um, and what this does is, uh, arguably, it strengthens the social order, right? Because after this festival of equality, um, everything goes back to the way it was. You know, people are then again unequal, and um, the social order is are they're reminded of who's who's boss and who's the worker later um and i mention this because in functionally this seems to bear a striking resemblance to carnival which is a, a festival within christianity um and it happens about the same time it's february it's before lent and I, I don't know, i'll i'll make some suggestions later that maybe there's a connection between these two that it's not just a coincidental similarity when we get to the middle ages 
Now, as for the importance of wine in everyday life, the Greeks had a whole set of paraphernalia for drinking wine. And it starts with, and we'll look at some of these in class. It starts with the crater, which comes from the word keranimi, which means to mix. It's a big sort of vat, which you uh, mix the wine, yes, with water. Okay, so, so the Greeks, you know, contrary to everything you've ever heard in modern enology and, and wine tasting, um, they mix their wine with water. Um, in various proportions, and this would be decided upon by a person who is in charge of the drinking party. He's called the symposiarch, okay? That means the, the leader of the symposium, who could decide based on what people were doing to make it a little stronger or make it a little weaker uh, as the event went on. But in general, there's always water in, in the wine. And people have argued, why did they do this? Okay, is it because the wine was really thick and sweet? Is it because the they're really drinking water and they're just purifying it with the wine because it'll kill back, you know, bacterial microbes and things? Um, it's immaterial. It doesn't matter what, exactly why they did it. They did, um, and uh, I think it makes sense that they wanted to get wine as strong and sweet and high in alcohol as possible to ship and store. But once they were actually drinking it, it actually lightens it up a bit. And I know this is gonna sound really weird, but try it sometime. It's, it sounds really absurd, but many wines, actually the, the aroma and the flavor opens up with an ice cube. I mean, they, they didn't have ice cubes, but, um, but, but a little water sometimes actually does make it taste better, makes it more palatable and drinkable. Um, so, and in fact, to the ancient Greeks, to drink wine unmixed, which is called ekratos, meaning not in the crater, um, that's kind of uncouth. That's for people who just want to get drunk and don't really care about flavor and enjoyment. So um, the symposiarch also uh, decided how many craters were going to be drunk. Usually three is about the limit. And we're talking craters about my, you know, five feet high and, and you know, four or five feet in diameter. They're very big. Um, and I'm not sure how many this would people this would be intended for, but at least in a play by Eubulus, it says by, by the time you get to the fourth crater, people start doing weird things. They start expressing their hubris, which means they start boasting about themselves. By the fifth, they're shouting. By the sixth crater, they are reveling. To the seventh, their eyes begin to go black. By the eighth, uh, there begin to be summonses, <laughs> the words the police are sent for. To the ninth, to bile, meaning that they start to get sick and throw up and everything. And by the 10th um, crater, people uh, begin to succumb to madness and start hurling the furniture around and doing crazy things after they're sick, I guess. So it's a warning not to drink too much, of course. From the crater, the wine went into a kind of pitcher, and this is something called an oinokoe, Oinos meaning uh, is the word Greek word, root for wine. Oinology means means the study of wine. Um, so the oinokoe is the pitcher, which is dipped into this big crater, and then you've got a pitcher full of wine, um, about that size. That thing. That's about the size. Um, and then from there it went into a cup, which is very different from the one I've got now. They would go into a kylix. Okay, a kylix is much wider, and it would have two little handles on it. It's actually really difficult to drink out of without spilling on yourself, which is why I'm drinking out of this much simpler, um, old, much older form for for a cup. But imagine it much much wider than this. Okay, and it's got a long stem, very much like exactly like this one. Um, and this is the kind you always see at symposia, okay? And they're often decorated. There's paintings um, yeah, on the side and things. We'll, we'll definitely look at them closely in class. They're very beautiful, and they're one of the most prized objects that survived from the ancient world. There's, the, there's myths written on them and everything. So the logic of the shape might seem a little strange to you. Why would you have a narrow stem and a really, really wide sort of candy dish-like shape for the whole thing? Because the wine can spill out very easily. But what it does is it forces you to concentrate on what you're doing, to drink very carefully, or you do in fact get it all over yourself. And when you get to the bottom of the kylix, there's usually a smudge of lees, because remember they don't filter their wine, so you get some muck at the bottom. And this is where you begin to play a game called kotabos, okay? And kotabos, uh, you do reclining, because remember the Greeks all reclined while they ate and drank at the symposium on couches. And you take the kylix in the right hand, I won't try it with this thing, and you fling the lees at a target. And there's a little statue on a pedestal with a few bells on it, like a lampstand. And the idea is that you knock this circle of metal off 
so it falls into the dish and rings um, when it lands into it. And you basically make wagers about who can hit the target with their lees. So this is, it's Greek quarters, basically, <laughs> you know, nothing, or pong or something like that, right? It's a drinking game. Uh, and there are people depicted flinging their lees of the, out of their kylix, kylices, and, um, and some great players become heroes, you know, like sports figures, okay? Um, but all of this stuff, of course, takes place at a, an event called a symposium. A symposium is not a meal. Strangely, the Greeks drank after their meal. I guess that makes sense, right? So you're not drinking on an empty stomach. But it takes place in a separate room called an andron. Andros, and it means man. It's only men are invited to these things. We can definitely talk about why. Um, and they would sit on this raised platform on couches, arranged, um, and usually three people to a couch, so they, they would drink together. Um, during the symposium, you would discuss important topics, philosophy, politics, the arts, but it's not a sober event, okay? It's, it's in fact, um, it's not a whole lot like the one you may, the symposium you may be familiar with in Plato, which is everyone, there is one drunk guy there, but, but most of the people are just philosophizing and rationally discussing. In most symposiums, the whole point is you get blind stinking drunk, and uh, there's a wonderful account that's not Plato, it's Xenophon's with, his, with an X, it takes place in 421 BC, even though he's writing in 360, that's about one in the past. And, um, and it's really, it's a different affair, because there's, there's, um, there's almost always naked flute girls, um, where they wear these diaphanous veils and things. They're, they're not, they're people's wives, they're prostitutes. Uh, there's usually boys there too, but there's, but, but regular respectable women are not invited to these things. It's only, um, the flute girls. So, so Xenophon, let me, let me, uh, read just a little bit to you. Now the tables were removed and in due order, they'd poured out the libation and had sung the hymn. To promote the revelry, there entered now a Syracusan with a trio of assistants. First, a flute girl, perfect in her art, next a dancing girl, skilled to perform all kinds of wonders. Lastly, the bl bloom of beauty, a boy who played the harp and danced with infinite grace. The Syracusan went about exhibiting his troupe, whose wonderful performance was a source of income to him. After the girl had played, them, uh, played for them upon the flute, and the boy did a turn upon the harp, both performers, as it would appear, had set the hearts of everyone rejoicing. Socrates turned to Callias, a feast upon my word, O princeliest entertainer. Was it not enough to set before your guests a faultless dinner, but you f must feast our eyes and ears on sights and sounds this delicious. In other words, after the meal, they had this um, whole event with all the, um, the flute girls and everyone. So come on, the jester shouts, give us a tune upon the pipe and we'll show you how to dance. So saying, he got up and mimicked the dances of the boy and girl in burlesque fashion. And inasmuch as the spectators had been pleased to think the natural beauty of the boy enhanced every gesture of his body in the dance, so the jester must give a counter-representation in which each twist and movement of his body was a comical exaggeration of nature. And since the girl had bent herself backwards and backwards until she was nearly doubled into the form of a hoop, she's like a contortionist too, so he must try to imitate a hoop by stooping forward and ducking down his head. So this is, this is, he's making fun of the two guys. So, And finally, the boy had won a round of plaudits for the manner in which he kept each muscle of the body in full exercise while dancing. And now the jester, bidding the flute girl quicken the time, presto, presto, prestissimo, go faster, fell to him capering madly, tossing his arms and legs and head together until he was tired out and threw himself deadbeat upon the sofa, gasping. There, that's proof my jigs are splendid exercise. At any rate, I'm dying of thirst. Let my attendant kindly fill me a mighty goblet. <laughs> okay, so, um, and at this point, what happens, um, everyone's laughing and their th throats are parched, and so the symposiarch has to call for more wine. And Socrates says, nay, gentlemen, if drinking is the order of the day, I heartily approve. Wine, it is in very truth that moistens the soul of man, that lulls one at once all cares to sleep, even as the mandrake drugs our human senses, and at the same time kindles light-hearted thoughts as an oil in flame. Yet it fares with the banquets of men, if I mistake not precisely as with plants that spring and shoot to earth, when God gives these vegetables growth to full a draft of rain, they cannot lift their heads nor feel the light air breathe through them. But if they drink in if only the glad supply we need, they stand erect, they shoot a pace and reach maturity of fruitage. So we too, 
if we drench our throats with overcopious drafts, ere long may, be, may find our legs begin to reel and our thoughts to falter, we shall scarce be able to draw breath, much less speak a word in season. But if to borrow the language f- from the mint of Gorgias... If only the attendants will bedew us with a frequent mizzle of small glasses. <laughs> Just give us little sips, that's fine. We may not be violently driven out by wine to drunkenness, but with sweet seduction reach the goal of sportive levity. So let's have fun and not get really rowdy and crazy. So he says, come now, bring me a lusty stoop of wine to moisten my understanding and inspire me. And then they carry out this proposition unanimously. Um, the cupbearers should imitate good charioteers, push the cups around, quickening the pace with each circuit. So, so the Greeks, you know, they're, they're not only drinkers of wine. I think they're actually connoisseurs of it also. Um, let's, let's talk briefly about a guy who is the author of what's really the oldest cookbook in the Western tradition, written by a guy named Archestratus. Um, which it only survives in fragments, mostly about fish and a little about bread. But, but this is this is written in Greek Sicily, um, near Syracuse or Gala, um, and so at the very least it attends attests to how extensive the wine trade was, but also really how discerning these Greeks could be as consumers. I think very very they chose their wine very carefully. So let me read this to you out of Athenaeus. Uh, it's oh sorry Archestratus, which is in the larger book by Athenaeus. I'll explain that later. When you have drawn a full measure for Zeus' savior, you must drink old wine, bearing on its shoulders a head hoary indeed, a wine whose wet curls are crowned with white flowers, a wine begat of wave-girdled Lesbos. And Bibline, the wine that hails from Phoenicia, I recommend, though I do not place it in the same rank with the other. For if you were not previously on intimate terms with it, and it catches your taste but unawares, it will seem more fragrant than the lesbian, and does retain a bouquet for a prodigious length of time, but when you come to drink it, you will find it inferior by far. Well, in your estimation, the lesbian will be sour, worthy not merely of wine's prerogatives, but of ambrosias. Um, So he's sort of the... Robert Parker, the ancient world, right? he's telling you, he's giving you a recommendation, not a score per se, but he's getting close, right, to, to rating these wines. Um, and of course, this is for our Athenian aristocracy, people who could afford um, private drinking parties and importing expensive wine. But for most people, there's also a common way of drinking wine. This is a tavern, basically, or a capaloi, in which you could buy wine in bulk. You could actually even take it home to take out, you know, sort of an operation. Um, you could drink on the premises also if you wanted a, a couple, a few drinks. Um, uh, so we know about these not from philosophy per se, because that's for upper class people, but from comedies. And I think it's interesting. Those are, of course, directed to more plebeian audiences, right? Um, but they seem to have, you know, this kind of tavern seemed to have been all over the city of Athens. And you find in these comedies a couple of figures as stock characters. They're always there. There's always a cook. There's always a tavern keeper pouring wine. Um, and in the archaeological digs of these sites, um, there's broken pottery cups. There's sometimes remains of food. There's fish bones. So you, I, you get a picture of what's going on in these. They're eating and drinking and having fun. And... The tavern keepers are, and barmaids are always rowdy. They always cheat their customers. They're always tricksters. There's gambling going on. And it's a place where degenerates hang out, right? And criminals. And, and very clearly, very different kind of clientele than those who have private symposia in their homes. Um, so perhaps the, the most important or interesting part of wine is the, um, in the ancient world, is the physiology of wine. And what, what I mean by that, physis means nature, right? So this is the the medicinal qualities of wine, what it does to our bodies. And surprising as this may sound to you, wine was categorized as a food that is hot and moist in the humoral system of um, physiology, meaning that it's analogous to our blood, it converts into our blood, and therefore it's very nourishing. In fact, it, it is a necessary nutrient. Okay? It's not something you should think about living without. Okay, I like this, right? Um, so it is, um, it, it's by its very definition, it's nourishing. Okay. Um, now, how this works is that there are, when you eat food, it's transformed into your body, into blood and various, uh, and into your flesh to replenish it, and into these four fluids that go through your body called the humors. Um, 
and the blood is the one that's made in the liver. Blood replenishes the parts of our body. It goes into, it's refined in our lungs. It goes up as a vapor into our brains or what's what, into what's called spirits. And in fact, we get the word spirits for alcohol directly from this kind of distillation process that goes on in our body. Very interestingly, we'll come back to that also later. Um, but the idea is that the quality of the wine to start with, because it is going to become your blood and your body and eventually circulate in your brain in the form of spirits, the quality of the wine is really going to influence your emotion and your intellect and the things that go on in your brain, so, especially your thought. You want clear thoughts. So, so you don't want thick, turbid wine that's going to give you nightmares okay, or give you a headache. This is, this is how, they, how they figure out, really. You know, um, it's their, their very well-thought-out logic, really, of why a bad wine will give you a headache and uh, make you um, hungover. There's also a very interesting um, book that is attributed to Aristotle. It's not really written, but probably written by him. It's a pseudo-Aristotelian text that calls for, um, that answers fascinating questions about wine in the, in the terms of the, this physiology. And it, it gives you, um, I think, what is the origin of the, an idea that persists right down to the early modern era, is that cabbage prevents drunkenness. <laughs> I can't vouch for this at all, but it's repeated in medical texts all the time. You eat cabbage, you won't get drunk. Um, and the, uh, but there are also fascinating questions in here. The author queries uh, why drunken people are unable to have sex. And he says it's because for sex, one part of the body needs to be hotter than the rest, and the drunks are hot all over. The heat is distributed everywhere, so the heat can't focus on the parts that are supposed to perform, I guess. He also explains why drunken people see double. Let me answer this, so read it to you. It is it because it is even and complete only if it catches in one glance and evenly the optic ray of the things which are seen. But if this optic ray moves in a confused manner on account of the drunkenness which occurs, then the vapors arising from the wine grow too thick, that ray changes into various parts, and the perception is also different for this reason. If the eye then sees the object which, is, which it perceives, it sees the objects as many different objects. So uh, we know it's the eyes not focusing <laughs> on and picking up and not connecting in the brain, but, but he's got the exact opposite, is the, the light rays come into your eyes and they're not they're getting mixed up so so and finally the person i should mention and we can certainly discuss him further in class is hippocrates the father of medicine who categorizes wine by its humoral qualities and and its properties saying that some are emetic that make you sweat some are good for various ailments some kinds of wine are good for certain people um and wine especially is good for old people laxenum est meaning uh Lack of venum, senum, well, you know, venum, lack senum est. Wine is the milk for old people. So ever, as you get older, you should drink more wine and stronger wine. <laughs> and, um, and, and also there's a whole slew of ailments that are good for, um, that wine is good for. So this very, very positive view of wine um, and, and its place in medicine is handed down through Western civilization, the idea that it promotes health as long as it is in, um, not in excess. Um, but strangely, Hippocrates also has a passage where he says it's good to get drunk once in a while. It purges your system, and um, and you should do it once a month. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, and there's also, I should mention, a, a combination of, that's really medieval, but it comes down to us. It's a mixture, mixture of spices and wine um, that is called Hippocras, and there's a special kind of bag-shaped filter that you filter out the spices with, which is essential for making Hippocras in the Middle Ages. But but it's it's his name, Hippocrates, that it comes down to as a, for a kind of spiced wine, and hopefully we'll make some when we get to the uh, Middle Ages. It's great stuff. And I guess I will see you on Monday, and um, we'll talk about wine. Ciao.